huge news, everybody. For the very first time, a Super Grandmaster has faced the Wagon Gambit. And in this video, we're going to be going over this Blitz game that was played in a titled arena on LeeChess.org. And with the white pieces, we have Dimitri Andraken, the world's 20th highest rated player. And with the black pieces, and we're going to be looking at this from the black's point of view, we have Monkey King, an international master from the United States of America, who has started playing the Wagon Gambit uh, incredibly and has added quite a lot of games to the Lee Chess database. And I do want to give a really big shout out, not only to Monkey King, but to everybody else that has kind of been playing the Wagon Gambit. A real quick update on the Gambit. When I started making videos on this about a month ago, it had about 100 games in the database. Well, we have 10 x the popularity of the Wagon Gambit, and there's now over 1,000 games in the Lee Chess database. And I just wanted to give a huge thanks because it really does mean a lot to me, not only that people are actually playing it, like I'm sitting here making videos, you guys are actually playing the stuff, and then sometimes you're playing it against Super Grandmasters. This is incredible stuff, so I cannot wait to see how a top player handles the Wagon Gambit. Let's get right to it. This is D4, Knight F6, C4, A6. This is the start of the Wagon Gambit, and after C3, you play B5, sacrificing one pawn. After takes, takes, Knight takes B5, you play E5, and this is the start of the Wagon Gambit. And now the question is, how does a 2700 plus rated player handle this particular opening. Well, he accepts the gambit, and after knight to e4, you would begin to immediately threaten bishop to b4. White needs to do that, and Andre King comes up with the most popular move, knight to c3. But after bishop to b4, applying pressure to c3, White here came up with a quite different move than you would usually expect. The most popular move by far is bishop to d2, but Andre King comes up with this interesting idea queen to d4, and in this way you're protecting your knight, but you're also making a double attack. You're attacking the knight, you're attacking the bishop. All in all, it looks like a very clever move, but it turns out that black also has a very clever move up his sleeve, and plays this exciting move, rook to a4, and you're protecting your bishop, and you're kind of protecting your knight through this tactical defense of being able to use this check, so there's no time for white to grab any material. This guy is pinned, so you're not able to take the rook. Everything is totally fine, and now all of a sudden, White needs to move the queen again, and this is the incredible thing that happens here. There's only one really good move for whites, but it's not actually an easy move to play, and in fact, Andrake in here goes a little bit wrong and plays queen to e3, allowing bishop to c5 with pressure on f2, and all of a sudden... Andraken is in a lot of trouble. This is horrible stuff. Uh, Black has actually has a fantastic position against a super grandmaster. But I do want to come back and show one other incredible line. Allow me this one tangent because there's an amazing queen sacrifice line that is possible here if you play the top stockfish line. So stockfish says there's only one move that white can possibly consider. You need to put your queen on d3, and from this square, you're still protecting your knight on c3, so everything is fine. But this might not be such an easy move to play if you see this idea of playing bishop to a6, attacking the queen, and you're gaining a tempo on the queen. However, things are about to get a little bit wild, because if we had seen this variation in the game, the queen might have gone to c2, and all of a sudden, the rook is under attack, and now it's suddenly looking like, wait a minute, I need to keep my rook here because it's tactically defending my knight, so what the heck is going on? Well, it turns out you can leave the rook where it is and play queen to h4, <laughs> threatening to start taking this pawn, and things are getting a little bit wacky, getting a little bit wild, and if white plays g3, brace yourself, sorry, I needed, I need a moment to just kind of clear my head, you play knight takes c3, <laughs> you just take, you leave the queen hanging, because if this gets recaptured, you put the knight back on e4, delivering this discovered check. <laughs> and if the king decides to move over, it's checkmate. <laughs> this is just ending the game. So obviously you're going to need to play bishop to d2. And after the bishop takes, for example, you can maybe just start giving your queen away as one option, but I think most people are going to play king to d1, but now you play rook to d4, and you set up all of these threats, and this is wild position where Stockfish is like, yeah, it's like pretty close to equal here, but obviously there's some really, really wild stuff, and black is actually just threatening a checkmate in one. Uh, it's kind of an incredible situation where you're down five points of material, you've sacked the queen, but you can't play something like e3, 
because this is just simply checkmates. Look at how this bishop covers all the squares. This bishop covers all the squares. The bishop's protected. So what are you actually meant to do? Well, the computer says that this is actually so bad that you should just sack the queen now <laughs> and allow this capture. And there's obviously some other wild stuff that maybe you could consider in this position. You could consider knight to h3, which, you know, looks like maybe you're winning some stuff back. But then after you just move this guy away, the king is going to have to go somewhere. And at some point, you're going to be winning this queen. And okay, it's just kind of like a weird position where white's probably not going to take right away or whatever, but you're going to get to this kind of unequal position. But the black pieces are just so well coordinated and the white structure doesn't really make any sense that this is actually going to end up being winning for black, in fact. So there's a lot of fun that could still potentially be had, even if the opponents do find the best move queen to d3. Just sack your queen and go wild. Have a little bit of fun. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the tangent. I know some people just, they can't handle the tangents, but I had to get that one off my chest because it was just so cool. But instead, we saw Andraken play queen to e3, allowing bishop to c5. And now all of a sudden, white is facing a really awkward choice because if you decide uh, to just allow black to take on f2, you might be in a lot of trouble. And white comes up with a very interesting and high-level sacrificial idea. Uh, and he stakes the knight with the queen. Uh, and in this way, he's able to get a couple pieces because he's also picking up this rook, and now he's on this bishop. And white is actually technically one point ahead, but this is some sort of weird, wacky imbalance, and it actually turns out that this should be good for black. Was there any other option? Well, you can allow black to capture on F2, but if you allow something like this, uh, things are going to work out very well, and there's multiple ways that black could continue. Maybe you could just take this and drop your bishop back, or you can even consider giving this check, forcing this king to move around, and bishop to B7 is a nice tactical way uh, to potentially defend this bishop because you can no longer remove the defender of the bishop because this would be coming with check. It's also sorts of fun stuff that would be happening to black. So for that reason, we saw Andraken sacrifice the queen, get to this position, and now after bishop to b4, the bishop goes to d2, and this actually should be a winning position for black. And it all kind of comes down to if you can keep enough pressure on the white king, if you can get some of the material back, queen to e7 is an excellent choice. Defending this guy, starting to put some pressure on the e pawn. Knight comes out to defend the pawn. Knight comes to c6. So black is inevitably going to be winning one of these pawns back. Now comes e3. White still needs to be able to get his stuff out and get castled. One of the big benefits here... Uh, from the black point of view, is that you are a little bit ahead in development. It's easier to castle. Black goes ahead and gets the material back, takes the pawn, and after bishop to e2, we see bishop going to b7, attacking this knight. Now after a3, we see takes, 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 a lot of trades. But after takes, this is where things begin to go a little bit wrong for black. Not like majorly wrong, but throwing the advantage away. Because we've seen this kind of series of trades and in kind of the heat of it, in the moment, black just continues to trade. And this is going to lead to an end game where at least white is able to get castled and keep the king safe. So the last way here for black to potentially keep an advantage, and Stockfish says this is still like minus two. Like this is very bad. This is like just winning for black. The way to continue was with bishop to a6. Now, I'm not one to talk. I think if I was playing a super grandmaster, I'd just see a way to get a nice, safe, and equal position. I might also be tempted to go for it, but bishop to a6, keeping the pieces on, uh, preventing this king from being able to get castled, would have made the game a lot better for black, because after we see this capture, we see both sides getting castled, and now things have kind of settled down. The end game actually technically has equal material, and Stockfish will say this is about my uh, this is about 0.0. .0. Like this is very very close to equal. If anything, maybe it's a little bit easier to play with black, but certainly white has survived the worst of it. And uh, white comes up with the idea of centralizing. We see the rook come over to b8, putting some pressure on the b pawn, and now we see a very large trade of pawns. Uh, you're not going to be able to take this guy. I guess due to rook to a8 coming. So instead, we see the queen takes, and we're just swapping everything down, and we're into some sort of endgame. Uh, and it's really a series now of who can outplay who, and we have a little bit of an imbalance. Black is just trying to trade off all of the pieces. Black makes a little bit of an escape for the king. Maybe the king is going to go this way. Nothing too much is happening. So uh, the question is, how can a grandmaster outplay an IM from a position like this? Is it possible? The queen comes back. She's attacking the rook. The rook needs to get... Uh, protected. The knight is hopping around. 
Black Queen is trying to be pesky, attacking this e-pawn from far away. We see some checks. We see this rook come back to defend this pawn. We see Black slowly marching on this side of the board. Black Queen continues to stay as pesky as possible. King runs over here, just in case you need to be safe. It's a long endgame where everything is actually pretty well played for a very long period of time. Queen continuing to be as pesky as possible. Keep keeping eyes on the rook. Keep eyes on the pawn. Nothing much happening, but uh, we don't have the times on the clock, but I think at some point here... Um, white begins to, first of all, temporarily sacrifice this pawn. This was an excellent choice. We get to this position, and this was the first of two missed opportunities for white, or at least this was uh, one. And I think they're both kind of getting low on time now, but knight to d4 here, which is a fork that was missed during the game. So that was the first time that white was actually winning during this entire event. But we see the piece is just kind of bouncing around. Not very easy for either side to make progress, but I think it is actually black that is running out of time. Had to go up against a super GM who was able to move a little bit faster in this difficult endgame. Uh, and unfortunately, that was kind of story of the events. Nothing really is happening here. Both sides are just kind of making random moves very quick. We'll speed it up to simulate the blitz pace. Even here, uh, Black unfortunately lost a pawn, but it doesn't really change the evaluation too, too much. But then on the very, very last move of the game by Black, we see this very large mistake, uh, losing the queen, but I think black had less than a second, but really overall an exceptionally good game, got a winning position against a super grandmaster. Uh, this position is already like minus two. Then there was some very long end game where they black got dirty flagged, but, uh, actually excellent game, a really cool example of what to do against the wagon gambits. A lot of cool lines along the way. I hope you enjoyed. Please help me get to 50,000 subscribers. That would be the coolest thing that you could do. Want to get there by the end of the year. Bye.